Well, welcome to Haven Heights Baptist Church. Welcome to those who are here and welcome to those listening online. A few announcements here before we begin. Next week, we'll begin our ladies only Sunday school class. And so next week, uh, ladies of the church will meet at 930 in the children's church room. So ladies will meet in the children's church room. There's more space in there to social distance. So next week, we'll begin that class. Vacation Bible School is going to be the week of July 12th. It'll last for one week. It'll be Monday through Friday. It'll start at 6 p.m. and go until 8.30 p.m. And so if you would, even now, please be praying for Vacation Bible School. And if you're a member of the church, please consider, please consider serving and how the Lord may direct you to that. We have new signage in the parking lot, so it's a bit confusing right now. The stripes don't align with the signs, but we'll be restriping those in the days ahead. And so next week, that should all be ready to go. And so please do park in the appropriate areas. Last announcement here, please check out our new website. The website's on the front of your bulletin. So please feel free to check that out and to pass that along to others who may be looking for a church home. Let's take a moment now to prepare our hearts for worship. Our call to worship comes from the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you this morning for your gospel, and we thank you that it is your very power that simply by hearing and simply by believing, we can be saved and we can be made right with you. Father, this morning we pray for your help, and we pray that you'd help us to believe the faith once for all delivered to the saints, and this morning we pray that you would help us to pass this faith onward. Father, we pray that as the Apostle Paul said, we pray that we would be unashamed of this gospel. Help us to embrace the good news that Jesus died for our sins and was raised so that we might be certain of forgiveness. We pray this morning that you'd help us to believe this good news, and we pray that you would help us to live a life that declares this good news to those around us. And so we pray for the preaching of your word yet to come. We pray for clarity and we pray for boldness. We pray that in our preaching yet to come, we pray that we would see Christ and we pray that we would see what he has done and we pray that it would change our very lives. Father, we pray that we would be changed. And so we pray for our work. And we pray that at our place of work that you would help us to be loving and bold with others. We pray that you'd help us not to shrink back, but to gently press in. We pray that you'd give us both the opportunity and the courage to have spiritual conversations with those around us. We pray for our families. We pray that you would give us both opportunities and persistence to pray with our children and to talk with our family about you. We pray for our church. And we pray that you'd give us opportunities to share your gospel in the community. So we think of and we pray for Vacation Bible School. We pray that children would come this summer. And we pray that many would hear of Jesus. And we pray that many of our children would come to believe. Father, in your great mercy, we pray that your gospel would go out from among us. We pray that your gospel would bring many to salvation simply by hearing and by believing. And so, Father, we pray for you to open eyes. Open eyes, open hearts, open ears that many might hear of you. We pray for other Christ-centered churches meeting this very hour. And we pray for True North and Crossroads and North Clinton and still others. Father, we pray that the gospel would radiate from these pulpits. We pray that many in this area and even around the world would be saved through these messages about to be preached. 
We pray for those in our faith family who are hurting this day. We pray for those in need of a special touch of you. We pray that in your grace you would make yourself known. We pray for our tithes and our offerings. And Father, we pray that you would use these monies to spread your fame. We pray that you would receive our worship. We pray that you would be pleased. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand with me? Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is a victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him who overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon fire and sword. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whene'er we hear that glorious word. Faith of our fathers hold Faith of our fathers, we will strive to win all nations unto thee. And through the truth that comes from God, mankind shall then be truly free. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to thee 
till death. Faith of our fathers we will love, both friend and foe, in all our strife, and preach thee to as love knows how. By kindly words and virtuous life, faith of our Father's holy faith, we will be true to thee till death. You may be seated. We'll now hear our scripture reading. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 11. These are the words of our Lord. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for in assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were condemned for, commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did, By faith, he was commended for his righteousness. When God spoke as well of his offerings, and by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life, so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who had pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about these things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place, he would later receive as his inheritance beyond and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, and were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who is past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had, who had made him the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. And these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the same things promised. They saw saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on the earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one, Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abram also reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from earth, from death. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. By faith, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. By faith, Moses' parents 
hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and that they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Japheth, about, God, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who brought, forth, who brought through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of the lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies and armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might even gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and floggings and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received that they had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. The words of our Lord. Please stand with me as we sing our next hymn. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul it is well sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious 
was thought. My sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. You may be seated. Hey guys, look, this guy is a Jesus guy. I was a few weeks into college. I needed to go to the store to get some pens, and my classmate asked if he could go to the store with me. I said that he could go with me, and so off we go. We get back from the store, and my classmate begins to tell anyone he can find, you guys need to take a ride with Lance sometime. He said, Lance listens to the craziest music. And in my car, I was playing this Christian CD, and I didn't think a thing of it, but he sure did. And he began to sing the songs that were in my car. Apparently, as we were talking, he was committing them to memory. And then he sang them in a mocking way, and he began to tell everyone, hey, this is a Jesus guy. And he meant it as condescending. But in the months that followed, the most amazing thing happened. Without even trying, I began to see people around me come to faith in Jesus. And truth be told, it happened not because of any great intentionality on my part. It happened because other people began to notice my faith. You know, so many times we make the gospel and sharing the gospel with others more complicated than it needs to be. Sometimes, maybe even most often times, People come to faith in Christ simply by seeing our own faith. That's what we see this morning. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to the book of Acts, chapter 16. We'll begin in verse 11. Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 11. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace. The next day, we went down to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of the district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of these listing was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. 
If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept us up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope for making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they were severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your whole household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer and ordered him, release these men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered you and Silas to be released. Now you can go leave in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens, and threw us into prison, and now they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them out from prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met the other brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. In our passage this morning, we read of the conversion of Lydia. We then read of the conversion of the slave girl. And then we read of the conversion of the jailer, and we ask the question, how did they come to believe in Jesus? And they come to believe in Jesus in part because they come face to face with Paul's faith. The faith of Paul affected them. For those taking notes this morning, the big idea is this, there is a faith that changes the world. Faith that changes the world. Such a faith is, number one, a going faith. Number one, a going faith. Number two, a guarded faith. Number two, a guarded faith. And number three, a gritty faith. A gritty faith. A going faith, a guarded faith, and a gritty faith. The faith that changes the world is, first of all, a faith that goes, a going faith. Two weeks ago, we saw in the middle of the night that Paul has this vision. And the Apostle Paul, from the Lord Jesus Christ, sees a man in Macedonia pleading for his help. And it's unmistakable to Paul, God wants us to go to Macedonia. And so the very next morning, the Apostle Paul and Silas, they sail from Macedonia. They reach the port, verse 1 or 11, Samothars, they spend the night, and then the next day, verse 11, they hike the next eight miles into the city of Philippi. So immediate obedience. 
God called us here, here we go. They spent a few days in the city, and then verse 13 on the Sabbath, Paul and his companions, that's Silas, Timothy, and Luke, they all go down to the river. Now, undoubtedly, in the city of Philippi, these men, they see all these amazing landmarks and sights and spectacles. And yet, what the Bible records is that they went down to the river. Now, that sounds a bit strange to us, and yet they go down to the river because this is where the people who met for God, or this is where the people who believed in God met for prayer. You see, if there weren't enough families to form a synagogue, God-fearing people, according to Jewish tradition, were to meet for prayer by the river. And so the Apostle Paul is a very practical man. The Apostle Paul decides something like this. You know, if we're going to make an impact for the gospel, if we're going to go and tell people about Jesus, wouldn't it make sense to start with those who already believe in God? Let's just go to where people who already believe in God are, and then let's tell them about the one true God. Let's tell them about Jesus. So they go down to the river, and there they meet a lady named Lydia. And Lydia believes in God, and Lydia is worshiping God. The Apostle Paul meets her. And although it isn't recorded, the Apostle Paul most likely said something to her like this. This God whom you worship is far more worthy than you know. You see, Lydia, this God who is the creator, he is also the savior. And this God whom you worship, this God loves you so much that he sent his one and only son to die for you. And this God whom you worship, he has a name, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus came to this earth, and Jesus lived among us. And Lydia, God wants to be with us. He wants to dwell with us. And he died for our sins. He removed the barriers so that we can have access to him. And God wants you to know him for all of eternity. And Lydia, don't you see this God whom you are interested in? He is far more interested in you. And we know God is interested in you because of what he has done. You see, Lydia, God is not a harsh God who demands all these things from you. Oh, no, our God is the God who has done everything for you. And God simply wants you to believe in what he has done for you in Christ. So how does Lydia respond? She believes, and of course she believes. She believes because she's hearing what her heart is longing for. I mean, just think about Lydia. Think about our own lives. Was it hard to come to church this morning? And yet there's 60, 70 people here? Imagine no church. Imagine no gathering of believers. And so you go down to the river and you just hope against hope that maybe there might be someone there to worship with you. And imagine that you know nothing of Jesus Christ. And imagine that your only grid for understanding the divine is that I better do what is right so that he doesn't come down hard on me. That's Lydia. And in her life comes the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul says, let me tell you about Jesus. Lydia hears everything that her heart is longing for, and so this is why she goes and tells her family. And she goes to her family, she says, let me tell you what I just heard, and let me tell you about the one true God, and his name is Jesus. And her entire family comes to believe. And then verse 15, we see that they're baptized. We're told that they're baptized, not because baptism saves them, but rather because baptism shows us exactly what they believed. And their baptism tells us that they are trusting in what Jesus Christ has done for them. When we baptize someone, they go under the water, and it's a sign, it's saying to those watching, we believe that Jesus has died for our sins, and we want to die for our sins. We want to be with Jesus, united with him, and then we're raised out of the water. Raised to a newness of life, just as Jesus was raised on the third day. And he is a new man. Because of what he has done, I can be a new person. That's what Lydia is declaring. Lydia has become a follower of Christ. And it happened in part because Paul went to her. 
Paul had a faith that is going. You see, this isn't really all that complicated. The Apostle Paul simply went to those who were likely to be interested in God. And so the question this morning, who are the people in our life who are already interested in God, and how can we go to them? Where are the people in our life who are already interested in God, and how can we go to them? One place they will certainly be is our our Vacation Bible School this summer. Our church has a rich history in Vacation Bible School, and if God chooses to bless this year like he has in the years past, many kids will come to our Vacation Bible School, and many of these kids will come from families who do not go to church. And it's amazing. They just sort of show up here, and we don't even know how they get here, but somehow they find out, and somehow God brings them to us. And here's the thing about these kids that come to Vacation Bible School. They naturally, instinctually believe in God. We've never once had to tell a kid that there is a God. They know that. Kids are naturally, instinctually interested in God. And all we have to do, and it's our privilege, by the way, is to go to them with the good news of Jesus. Or the Crisis Pregnancy Center. The Crisis Pregnancy Center is full of people like Lydia. And they believe in God, and they believe in God, or they wouldn't go to a Christian organization. And they go there, and they're desperate to hear what God is like, and desperate to hear that God loves them. And we can go to them. And we can say, you already believe in God. Now let me tell you about Jesus. This morning, may we be a people who pray, God, open our eyes to those who are searching. Open our eyes to those who are interested in you. And then, God, would you make us be willing, willing to go to them? Second, a faith that is guarded. Apostle Paul and Silas, they shared Jesus with Lydia. And the Lord gives them great success. Lydia and her entire family, they come to believe in Christ. And then after this great success, things get a little weird. Verse 16, the slave girl begins to follow the Apostle Paul around. The slave girl has this spirit, and she continually shouts, verse 17, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they're telling you the way to be saved? Now that's weird. To have someone following you around, just shouting behind you? But it also seems harmless. And yet notice that the Apostle Paul doesn't think it's harmless at all. Verse 18, he commands the spirit to come out of her. And the spirit leaves her instantly. And so we ask the natural question, what's so wrong with this? Weird, yeah, but is it really a problem? And even ask, don't they appreciate the press? I mean, isn't what she's saying true? Aren't they servants of the Most High, and aren't they telling people the way to be saved? And wouldn't we love that? Wouldn't we love for people to say, hey, those people at Haven Heights, they are servants of God. And if you hang around those people at Haven Heights, they will tell you the way to be saved. Wouldn't we love that? Apostle Paul doesn't appreciate it. The Apostle Paul commands the demon to come out of her, and the Apostle Paul commands the demon to come out not because of the content, but because of the source. It's not what she's saying, it's the power by which she's saying it. The PR, the press, is coming from a demon. You know, this is absolutely astonishing that Paul does this in one sense, because it'd be easy not to. And how easy it'd be to say, you know, it may be a demon, but hey, this girl is telling the truth. Or it'd be easy to say, you know, I know this is a demon, but look at the crowds that she is drawing. 
I know a demon is saying this, but look at all these people. And, 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 you know, maybe God is somehow in this in ways that we wouldn't expect. And, you know, if we just preach to these people, you know, maybe some are going to come to faith in Christ. But the Apostle Paul doesn't do that. And he condemns the Spirit because the Spirit is not from God. And so notice that Paul guards the faith. Paul refuses to let anything evil attach itself to the gospel. And if current trends continue, this is surely going to be a thing. There will surely be pressure to attach evil to the gospel. Wouldn't it be good for the church to embrace homosexuality? I mean, if the church were to embrace homosexuality, wouldn't that just be a great witness? You know, the entire world would finally see the church as loving and tolerant and and open. I pray we can see the evil in that. The evil of embracing evil for a supposed good outcome. Imagine if the Apostle Paul wouldn't have guarded the gospel. Imagine if the Apostle Paul would have been willing to partner with evil, if he'd have been willing to partner with this demon. You know what would have happened to the Apostle Paul? People would have said, oh, now we see it. The Apostle Paul just wants our money. The Apostle Paul is a salesman. He's a con man. That's what this demon girl does. She just wants our money. She'll tell you what you want to hear for a price. That's the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wouldn't have guarded the gospel. The gospel would be lost. And yet how easy it is to begin to mix the gospel with other things. Just one example of what I'm talking about. A few years back, the Southern Baptist Convention invited an elected official to speak at our convention. That sounds good, right? To invite an elected official to come and address the Southern Baptist Convention. And hey, after all, 1 Timothy chapter 2, aren't we to pray for our elected officials? And we did that. And aren't we to honor those in authority? Romans 13, and we did that. The elected official came and he spoke. And here's what happened afterwards. The media reported... So and so came to the Southern Baptist Convention and he spoke. And then the commentary began. Don't you see the Southern Baptist Convention is really just a political organization? And the gospel was lost. You know what a shame that is? We meet for one purpose as Southern Baptist churches. We meet to strategize how to take the gospel to the ends of the world. And the elected official came and the gospel was lost. Nobody cared about that. They cared about who came. It's a disaster. And how easy it is to do that. And how easy it is to begin to mix the gospel with community events. Or begin to mix the gospel with our politics. Or begin to mix the gospel with our business. And what happens when we do that is the gospel loses every time. When the gospel is mixed. The gospel is always overshadowed. Apostle Paul is unwilling to do that. He's unwilling to partner with evil. And so go the crowds. And so go his opportunity to speak to the masses. And it's a guarded gospel. And yet how good it is because the guarded gospel is always the gospel that brings freedom. Guarded gospel is a gospel that brings freedom. What happened to the slave girl? The demon leaves her. And she comes to faith in Christ. We must guard the gospel. Third, a gritty faith. Paul casts out the demon, and this is no small problem. With the demon gone, her handlers are angry. They realize, verse 19, their hope for making money is gone. And so they seize the Apostle Paul and Silas and they drag them into the marketplace and they say, hey, we're going to put you right here and you're going to get what's coming to you. 
And in a moment, the crowds turn on them. And the crowds turn on them because they're scared for their own lives. And they think, hey, if this guy like, took away their ability to make money, this guy's going to take away our ability to make money. And, and so we've got to do something about this. The authorities come, and the authorities come to one conclusion. You know, before you came, things were good. And now that you're here, there is chaos. You're the problem. You're the problem, so you have to learn your lesson. And so they take Paul and Silas, and they have them beaten with rods. And after they're flogged, they're thrown into prison. And not only are they thrown into prison, but notice that their feet are placed in the, so in the stocks. Their ankles are placed in iron cuffs while they sit on the floor. You know, this is a completely miserable situation. And yet, notice verse 25, they are praying. And we know why they're praying. They're praying because they're asking God for help, but they're also praying because sleep is impossible to come by. Sleep's impossible to come by. Their backs are bruised and bloody. Their feet are tied up. It's impossible for them to lay down. It's impossible for them to get any sort of rest at all. And so they choose to pray. And they pray, God, help us. And we expect that. If any of us were in that situation, we surely would be praying. And yet notice what they also do. Verse 25, they sing. And we're told specifically that they sing hymns. And in the Bible, hymns are songs about God's character. So catch what these men are doing. With bruised and bloodied backs, they're praising God that God is God. And they're praising God that God is all-loving. And they're praising God that God is all-powerful. And they're praising God that God is all-wise. You know, that's a gritty faith. They're saying, we know God. We know that God could choose to release us in a moment. And they surely believe this because in Acts chapter 4, they've seen God do this with Peter. And they know that Peter was in prison. And they know that an angel came and let Peter out. And they know that God can do this. And yet how gritty their faith is because in the same chapter, Acts chapter 4, they also saw their friend James die by the sword. Paul and Silas, they know that God can rescue, and they also know that God doesn't always rescue. They praise God for his character, and they say, you know, our God is the one true God, and our God can do what he pleases. And whether he chooses to rescue us, that's going to be fine with us, and whether he chooses not to rescue us, that's also going to be fine with us. You know what happens when they profess a faith like that? Other people notice. And these other prisoners began to say to one another, what is going on with these guys? I mean, can you believe this? They're praising a God that they believe in, and this God allowed them to be treated like this, and they're wondering, who are these guys? And as they're wondering, the miracle takes place. Verse 26, there's a violent earthquake, and the foundation is shaken. All the chains come loose and the prisoners are free. Fearing that the prisoners are going to make a run for it, the guard is ready to fall on his sword. The guard's going to kill himself. You see, the guard knows that the prisoners are free. That means I'm going to lose my life. And so rather than lose my life at the hand of another, I'm just going to take my life. Jailer decides to kill himself, and yet Paul says, don't do that, because we're all here. That's absolutely amazing. This is a far bigger miracle than the miracle of the shaking of the prison. All the prisoners are there. None of the prisoners have left. And so we ask the question, why are these prisoners still there? Like if their chains come off, if the door is open, and they can make a run for it, why are they still there? Answer, they are in awe of Paul and Silas. They're amazed at the faith of Paul. 
And so don't miss what's happening. They would rather be in prison with the Apostle Paul listening to him tell about his faith in Christ than free and miss the opportunity. All of these prisoners stay because they're saying, tell us more, Paul. Tell us more about this God and tell us more about how you believe in him. The jailer hears about this and he sees it and he falls before Paul and Silas and he says, I know you believe the truth. Will you just tell me the truth? Tell me, how do I get a faith like yours? How do I get a massive trust in an all-sovereign God? And how can my life make sense in the good times and in the terrible times? And how can I see the power of God in my life? And he says, what must I do to be saved? How can I know what you know? And Paul simply says, verse 31, believe. Believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. That's really the core, isn't it? Believe? Apostle Paul says you want to be saved? Believe. Apostle Paul doesn't say, well, let me tell you three things that you need to do. The Apostle Paul doesn't say, hey, come to my church. The Apostle Paul doesn't say, hey, the, the way that you need to be saved is you need to hear my three-point outline. Or the way that you need to be saved is you need to read this book. No, the Apostle Paul says, hey, the way to be saved is to believe. And what are you to believe? You're to believe in Jesus. You're to believe that Jesus is the one who has done everything for you. And you're to believe that you don't have to do all of these things. You need to believe in what he's done for you. And not only do you need to believe in Jesus, but you need to believe that he's Lord. Jesus is the one in charge. And Jesus is the one that we submit to and the one that we follow. The way to be saved is to believe. If you believe, you have a gritty faith. Faith that believes Jesus has done everything for me and a faith that believes Jesus is with me in the thick and thin. This is the God that the jailer comes to believe in. The jailer washes their wounds. And not only is it kind, but it's symbolic that you are now a part of my family and I'm a part of your family. We are brothers in Christ. And the jailer becomes so convinced that he wants others to believe. And so he goes to his family, tells them about Jesus. And just like in the case of Lydia, the family of the jailer hears about Jesus. And they say, this is what we've always longed for. You're finally telling us what our soul aches for. And it's amazing. All these people are coming to faith. And where's the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul is still in prison. Paul hasn't been released yet. You know what a word for us here, just a moment on this. You know, so oftentimes we think, you know, if people are going to see my faith and if people are going to come to, to Christ because of me, then I have to make Christianity look attractive. And we think that if anyone's ever going to see my life and to want Christ, they're going to need to see all that God's done for me. And they're going to have to see that I have really good kids. And if people are going to come to faith because of my life, you know, then I have to have this successful job. And if anyone's ever going to come to Christ because of me, then I have to wear the really nice clothes and drive the really nice car. But that's not true for the Apostle Paul. Paul's in prison with none of those things. And you see, sometimes our faith shines brightest in the darkness of our suffering. So just a word right now, like, like if you're here and you have wayward children, or you have the job that you're not really proud of, or you don't have the things that other people would value, don't say, well, God can't use me, because God certainly used the Apostle Paul. Word begins to get out that something crazy has happened. Word begins to get out that there's an earthquake and the magistrates or the leaders here, these prisoners could have fled, but they don't. And the magistrates finally realize, hey, Paul and Silas, they're not a threat. They're not a problem. 
And so verse 35, the leaders tell the jailer, hey, just let Paul and Silas go. And yet notice in verse 36 that Paul refuses. The apostle Paul says, hey, if they beat us publicly, then let them declare us innocent in the same public manner. You know, it's here we see just how tough the apostle Paul is. The Apostle Paul says, I'm not leaving without an apology, and that apology better be public. We'll leave when you say that you got it wrong. Now, we might be tempted to think, well, the Apostle Paul is tough because of his pride, but that's not true at all. The Apostle Paul is tough for the sake of those coming to faith in Christ. And Paul knows that a public announcement of innocence is greatly going to protect these new Christians. You know, a public exoneration will keep the public from thinking that these Christians are really evil and that these Christians were somehow released on some technicality. But if the officials come and say, no, 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 we're sorry, we missed it, these Christians are good guys. Oh, what that will do for the church. Paul is concerned with public appearance for the sake of the church. These leaders, they finally capitulate and they offer an apology. And Paul and Silas are released. Upon their release, verse 40, they go to Lydia's house where they meet with the other brothers and sisters and they begin to encourage them. And in verse 40, it's only one verse. The Apostle Paul goes to Lydia's house and the Apostle Paul goes to the church. One verse and what an ending. You see, the ending of chapter 16 is the beginning of the first church in Europe. The ending of Acts 16 is the first church in Europe. It's the multiplication of faith. And this is what faith always does. Real faith always multiplies. And that's exactly what happens. The faith multiplied and the church in Europe is born. And this is really good news for us this morning because this is our spiritual ancestry. How is the gospel preached from this pulpit today? It happened because the Apostle Paul went to Macedonia. You see, after the gospel was preached in Macedonia and after Lydia believed in her family and after the slave girl and after the jailer and after his family, after they all believed in Jesus Christ, they spread the gospel themselves. And the gospel goes to Austria and then it goes to France and then it finally goes to Britain. And then in 1492, when Columbus sails the ocean blue, the gospel comes to the new world. And then it finally comes to Ohio and then it finally comes to us. What is our spiritual ancestry? It goes all the way back to Macedonia. Because the Apostle Paul lived a life of faith. Let's pray. Father God, we pray this morning that you would give us faith. Father, we recognize that even faith is a gift from you. Father, we recognize that even Believing isn't something that we can work up. Father, we recognize that even faith has to be from you. And so we pray this morning that you would open our eyes to what Jesus has done. We pray that we would believe. And Father, we pray that our belief would be vibrant. Father, we pray that our faith would affect those around us just as it did through the Apostle Paul. Father, we pray that you would open our eyes to the seeker. We pray that you would cause us to share you with the hurting. And Father, we pray that you'd help us to live pure lives before even the hardened. And Father, we pray in your mercy that our faith would be effective. Cause our faith to affect others. And may they come to believe in you in a small part because of us. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. One thing I want to ask of you this morning, even as we sing, consider this question. Who is God asking me to get close enough to that they can see my faith? Who is God asking me 
to get close enough to so that they can see my face. Let's see. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the Blessed One gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinner, list to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Now hear this benediction from Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to those who believe. May that be true of us this morning. May we leave here not ashamed and may we believe in its power. You are dismissed.